Welcome everybody, ladies and gentlemen, members and guests. This is time. This is the lecture we have all been waiting for. It's truly a privilege as immediate past president of the ASMBS to introduce the 29th presidential address. This is Dr. John Morton. In honor of Dr. Morton today, as you can see, I'm wearing the same tie as him on this picture. But let me clarify that similar tie, I did not call him and borrow his tie, so we have a similar tie. So, so there are a couple of things I want to mention about Dr. Morton, and you probably don't know that. Uh, first, uh, he's from Montgomery, Alabama. That's where he's from. And with the last name Morton, it's difficult to tell that he's actually of Spanish heritage and speak fluent Spanish. Uh, we have the honor of uh, having John's parents here today, um, Elba and Glenn Morton. And uh, Elba is actually from El Salvador. She came to the United States to learn English at the age of 18. And she ended up, I'm not really sure why, but in Montgomery, Alabama. That's where she met Glenn. And they have been happily ever since. And Next, it all starts here. Wow. So I asked Gavit for a baby picture of John, and she couldn't come over this. So this is actually just a Google image of El Salvadorian baby. <laughs> and hence the disclaimer at the bottom right there, this is not John. It's just, but you get the message. I think John would look similar to this baby. It's a cute baby. But this is really John. Look at John, Ah, So look at those big eyes, big ears, you still have that. Puffy fingers, you still have that. Not a full set of hair though. You can see a little bit less up on top. So you know he was deemed for greatness. Even in high school, he was the National Merit Scholar. He vote most likely to succeed. Uh, and this is John's entire family. That's John right there. That's his parents and his two brothers. And then he went to Tulane University for his undergraduate degree, but he wanted to push further. He obtained a master in public health. And then he also attended uh, medical school at also Tulane University. He was always uh, into fitness. As you can see there, he's doing his first marathon. Uh, I'm not sure what John wanted to do back then, but uh, I see a stethoscope around your neck, John. <laughs> but I think he has changed that. And then he went to a surgical residency at Tulane University. Um, and as uh, you know, uh, everyone stated, he wants to, to even strive for even higher marks. He was the Robert Wood Johnson Master of Health Administration at M uh, University of Washington. Uh, he also was the health policy intern uh, for Senator Bill Fritz, so that's where his uh, first encounter with politics. And then he finished his residency at Swedish Medical Center, and this is uh, one of the pictures at his class, and here is his graduation pictures uh, at Swedish Medical Center. And then he attended uh, his MIS uh, fellowship at University of Northern California, I meant Carolina. And this is from his own work with regarding to interest of bariatric surgery. So this is his first encounter with bariatric surgery. He was interested because of its amazing result of weight loss and comorbidity resolution. It addressed one of the highest public needs and technical challenge for the surgeon. So following uh, fellowship, he um, arrived at Stanford. So these are the early days of uh, John at Stanford University. And immediately he started his research program. And now he has a very big and robust research program uh, contributing significantly to our uh, knowledge about bariatric surgery. This is his clinical team at Stanford. John had won numerous awards, including six teaching awards, multiple research awards, and really the prestigious Sages Young Researcher Golden Laparoscope Award. And in 2012, uh, Castle Connolly named him the National Physician of the Year. Uh, with regarding to contribution, he has uh, contributed more than 100 peer 
review publication, book chapters, and he presented at you know the oldest and most prestigious surgical organization, that's the American Surgical Association, 2014, on the topic does bariatric uh, does accreditation matters in bariatric surgery. With regarding to the ASMBS, he has contributed significantly to multiple uh, guidelines, systematic review. He is a co-editor of our textbook of uh, bariatric surgery. Uh, but really, his sig most significant contribution, I have to say, is really to change this coverage map uh, of sleeve gastrectomy when he was chair of the Access to Care Committee from essentially gray to completely green within two years period. When I was president, I named him the chair of the summit for the provision of coordin and coordination of care for the obese, and I'm sure he's going to be updating us uh, on that project. On a personal level, um, I want to introduce you Gavit. This is Gavit Woodard. Uh, she is John's wife, and they met at Stanford. So I asked Gavit, what do you really like best about John? And she did not say about his intellectual uh, but he said about his bronze body, as shown here, okay? But as you can see that whenever someone grabs their, their wrist and arm like this, meaning they're trying to flex something. I'm not really sure what you're trying to flex, John, but you're, you're flexing something. So this is John uh, and Gavit, you know, on more of a formal setting and an informal setting. They're enjoying time together. And in October of 2013, this is it. Uh, John tied the knot with uh, Gavit at Napa. It's a very extraordinary wedding. As you can see here, they're happily walking down the aisle. And this is looked like a picture from Hollywood um, with Matt Hutter texting in the background over there. <laughs> Uh, it's truly a privilege for myself and, and Jaime to be part of this uh, special occasion. Uh, as you can see here, this is uh, Gavit and John um, enjoying time at Christmas time, enjoying time with his uh, nieces in the car. But, you know, at work, they are a serious couple, okay? This is John on the left uh, performing a sleeve gastrectomy, and Gavit is a fourth-year surgical resident at UCSF performing I'm not really sure, lobectomy or something, because she is going to thoracic surgery uh, uh, once she complete uh, her residency. And here is John and Gavin having fun at the IFSO meeting uh, in Vienna. And uh, again, John uh, having fun with his uh, nieces. So John has also a passion for good food and wine, as you can see here. Um, we are in Napa, uh, to the picture of the left here, and John is teaching us everything he knows about wine. And one of his uh, favorite food is really steak, which he rarely gets at home, so he has to uh, uh, get it when he uh, have dinner with us. And good food and good wine cause a little sluggish here when uh, John is trying to climb. This is Machu Picchu, and he's getting a little tired, uh, maybe of the altitude. But John has always been into fitness. This is actually one of his uh, medal that he received when he was in college. And I'm going to show you uh, exactly what it is for. It's for power pool wrist wrestling. <laughs> Have anybody heard of wrist wrestling? This is what John used to look like there. Can you see his wrist? It looks pretty powerful, John. So that kind of explained what happened when I see him in the, in the uh, gym doing this exercise. I was like, John, what are you doing? First of all, that's a pretty nice um, forearm there, John. Good technique. Um, so once he do his wrist wrestling, he would actually go th uh, throw around some balls. So here it is him exercising, throwing some balls around. And then he tried to get me involved in this business of throwing balls around. But listen, I'm a single guy. I can't be throwing balls around here. So uh, I think you need to find yourself a new partner. But in all honesty and seriousness, um, these are my words to describe John. He's passionate about life. He is a team player. He's a true academician. He's a leader. And he's really devoted to make an impact. Uh, it's truly an honor uh, to introduce my friend, uh, a great bariatric surgeon, an academic leader, a family man, my true friend, 
someone who really made a difference with the ASMBS, Dr. John Magana Morton, our 29th president of the ASMBS. Thank you, Nan. I guess I had no reason to worry, so just maybe a little bit. Just to clarify, it's not just uh, wrist wrestling, it's actually arm wrestling, but be happy to demonstrate later. Let's see if we can get our slides up here. I do want to just say first and foremost, uh, thank you for the privilege and the honor of being your president, and I'm happy to share with you today just some of my ideas about where we are as a society, both within ASMBS and in the country. First of all, uh, we're having a terrific meeting here in LA with all um, great thanks to Rory Pryor and Michelle Gagné for putting together an outstanding course for all of us here. We're gonna top 5,500. And here we are in the land of fame and excess. And the one thing that they sometimes called Hollywood is a dream factory. And I think we can take a page from that because that's what we do every day. We provide hopes and dreams for patients. There's other parallels, as you can tell. This photo got a lot of use. Uh, what you can tell here is that we also have other analogs with Hollywood. We have lights, we have camera, and we certainly have action. The other thing I wanted to share with you is, uh, can Hollywood teach us anything? And I'm gonna show you that these three movies have some direct import to bariatric surgery. The Godfather, Rocky, and of course, Dirty Dancing. I do want to just, uh, as I said from the very beginning, thank everyone, recaps our year, and talk a little bit about where bariatric surgery is, and then close with a, a very strong belief I have, which is the need for everyone to have second chances. Of course, I want to thank my family. You can see them there. And of course, they mean the world to me. I also want to thank Dr. Um, Lewis Flint, who got me involved in surgery back at Tulane uh, many, many years ago and several other people that I want to thank. Uh, teachers, uh, first and foremost, I want to thank Dr. Tim Farrell uh, for allowing me to be his fellow, and of course, Dr. Eric DiMaria. Dr. DiMaria um, knew me as a fellow and took extra time out uh, to make sure that I knew what I had to know and got me going in the field of bariatric surgery. I think both of them are here, if you guys don't mind standing. Dr. DiMaria and Dr. Farrell, you can see them here. Thank you. And of course, I do want to mention uh, so many mentors, Dr. Sugarman, Dr. Buckwall, and Dr. Pores. They all have their own impact on me and, and on the society as well. Um, you talk to Harvey, it's like hearing the voice of God. He tells you how it is. Dr. Buckwald, anything you think you are going to do that's new and innovative, he did about 20 years ago. And Dr. Pores is an artist in so many different ways, but most of all, one-on-one, -on -one, and he's just a, a true, true friend. I also want to thank all of our California colleagues who are here. And um, this is a quote about California that is just like America, only more so. And uh, this is really where bariatric surgery, laparoscopic bariatric surgery, got started. Um, Alan Whitgrove was a guy who taught me how to do bariatric surgery. Um, at that point in time, there wasn't a lot of experience. I remember him distinctly. I thought he was a cool guy. He had that vibe around him, that California vibe, and uh, really taught me um, so much in the beginning. Malphobi taught about community involvement. Ed Phillips has been a godfather for so many of us in laparoscopic surgery. And of course, my, my uh, good friend, Kelvin Higa. Um, who is not only a gifted surgeon, but his level of humility, humility and commitment is just unparalleled. And I, I think all of them are here, so if you guys don't mind standing, uh, please let's give them a round of applause as well. Dr. Whitgrove and Phoebe and Phillips and Higa. Thank you. Finally, I want to I, I thank a few more people from the society. Each of these um, presidents taught me something. Uh, Robin Blackstone taught me about passion, commitment. Uh, Phil Schauer uh, taught me about accountability. I remember when I was in an access chair, he would ask, uh, how do we know we're really getting better when it comes to access? And he really put the test to me. And so I appreciate that and all of his counsel throughout the years. Of course, I want to thank Bruce Wolf. Bruce Wolf is probably the mentor that I have in bariatric surgery 
and he has meant uh, the world to me. We have a common connection at Stanford, and um, he went there as an undergrad, and we go see games together. He gives me lessons on bariatric surgery, but also lessons on life. So again, I'm going to ask everybody to stand one more time here for to recognize these surgical champions, Dr. Blackstone, Dr. Shower, and Dr. Wolf, if you guys don't mind standing. Thank you. Of course, our executive council, the stuff you're going to hear and see today didn't happen uh, in isolation. It happened because we have an outstanding team, and you see them all there. I think the future of ASMBS is very strong. And of course, the executive committee of the executive council, we have uh, weekly phone calls. We've gotten to know each other quite well, and we are a team that works extremely well together. And you'll hear more about these gentlemen in just a little bit. Of course, our staff, who are outstanding in every way, this wouldn't happen without them. I do want to mention um, Jenny Wynn. I know you're not supposed to have favorites, but I got to admit it, Jenny is my favorite, and she's just been so helpful throughout the past year. My leading lady, and you can see her there, Georgianne Mallory, and then you see the Hollywood sign in the background. I'm going to ask those two to also stand up and take a round of applause as well, so you can see them. Thank you. I wouldn't be here without my fellows, trained about 15 of them throughout the years, and you can see them listed there. Um, been very proud of that, and the fact that you know, they go on and found their own practices and keep moving forward. I think the closest we can get to mortality is education, where they beget what you like to do and, and move that forward. Our surgical residents who have been outstanding at Stanford, and of course the med students. Uh, we have these med scholars programs that allow us to um, do research with these students, and you can see over the years, we've been very successful with getting them involved, and you can see them there. Also, I wouldn't be here, obviously, without our clinic, and some of them are here today, and I really appreciate it. You guys make me look good. That's absolutely the truth. And our patients, of course. I always remember a quote from William Osler, the secret in caring for the patient is in caring for the patient, listening to them and hearing what they have to say, and also learning about what individual issues are coming up, and then you can do studies from it. I'll never forget a patient telling me about the fact that she got tipsier easier after surgery, and there was no studies on it. So we did a little study uh, where we gave everybody five ounces of red wine, had no trouble recruiting patients, and we were able to demonstrate the changes in alcohol metabolism before and after surgery, but it came from one patient. And these are some of our throughput in Stanford bariatric surgery. You can see the cases we've done and we tallied up the total number of pounds lost. And you can see there that um, clearly this is something that is important to me and dedicate a lot of time and effort to it. I want to take the point now of telling you a little bit about our goals for the society. And you can see those listed there. Nothing starts without access, and that's very critical, as you can see. And here are some of the accomplishments that we've had throughout the year, and I'm going to share those with you. Everything from the Obesity Summit to some of the member toolkits. You can see all the different task forces and committees there. I would love to highlight them all, but we do have to get to lunch at some point. But I do want to highlight some of these. Uh, I certainly want to highlight our foundation, who had an outstanding success with their walk. You can see Dr. Oz was at the walk in New York City. The other committee I really want to highlight is obviously access to care with all the efforts they've had around Leave No State Behind. Proud to report that sleeve gastrectomy is now being covered for TRICARE. We found out about that just a couple of days ago, and you can see all the good work that they're doing. Bariatric surgery training. You can see here that this has been a very active committee through the leadership of Dr. Alphonse Pomp and Corey McBride. We're working through our way for an added qualification of certification, creating an entire fundamentals, and you can see that there. Uh, that Dan Jones is leading, and we're looking to really get the seed for the future, which is training medical students and creating a longitudinal experience for them, and what better way than seeing what happens to our patients over time, and you can see that there. Clinical issues. This has been a very active committee. In fact, it's the committee of the year, and it's well-deserved. You can see all the activity they had, about 10 different position statements, about 10 different um, um, uh, articles that came out, and they're doing more and more as we progress. Insurance, uh, I know we have different issues that come up. Matt Bregman, Helmut Billy have done an outstanding job when it comes to the revision toolkits that are available now online, and you can see all the work that they've done. 
membership. We're looking to grow always, and you can see that we're looking to grow in different areas, adding new physician memberships uh, as well as physician assistant outreach. You can see our membership continues to grow. And I also want to mention another uh, committee, which is Quality Improvement and Patient Safety, led by Eric DeMaria and Dana Tellum. And you can see all the work that they've done. There is going to be a groundbreaking paper presented next year around closed claims registry. Eric DeMaria spoke to all the malpractice carriers throughout this country and got seven of them uh, to allow us to take a look at their closed claims. A lot of lessons to be learned that we can apply for the entire society. And of course, we're looking for the future where we train people in quality, and I know this committee will be leading those efforts. State chapters, this is very unique in the fact that we now have representation in all 50 states. A huge accomplishment, and many, many thanks to Chris, Joyce, and Rachel Moore. You can see there all the different state chapters represented. Those diamonds, I actually went to those chapters, and we wanted to make sure that we got the word and the message out to those chapters. Integrated Health, you see all the work that they've done from the support group uh, manual to uh, creating perhaps new certifications for PAs and nurse practitioners. I wish I had more time, but all of these committees did such outstanding work that I'm so proud of them. The toolkits are something new. You can go there to find out anything you ever wanted to know about the intragastric balloon or about revisional surgery or about low BMI or about pre-op weight loss. All those are member values available. And this is some highlights from the year in review in the media. These are some of the topics that came up, and you can see those listed there. And this is just demonstrating some of those um, headlines that came out around the year. Uh, some things around medication reductions and also cost and obese pregnancy patients. And you can see all of this encapsulated in this word cloud that gives you an idea of what's been of interest to the media in general over the past year. I now want to take a little bit of time to talk a little bit about where we are with obesity and the fact that it is a disease and how we can approach it and what's our role in this and really what's the leading public health problem in this country. So a couple of things. It is recognized that as a disease as well it should be. AMA were, was able to do that and I'm proud to say that ASMBS now has representation with the AMA. We all know this chart. We know that uh, there are medical problems head to toe when you carry obesity. The one thing that we don't often remember, and Dr. Adams reminded us of it, is it has impact when it comes to cancer mortality. I'm proud to report that through some of our efforts to the Obesity Summit, we are now involved with the world's largest oncology organization, the American Society of Clinical Oncology. They were at our Obesity Summit, and they shared the belief that weight loss can have the equivalency of chemotherapy for some hormonally sensitive cancers. ASMBS will be there, hopefully leading some of those efforts. You see this chart when you look at obesity and mortality. When does it start to rise? Really at a very low BMI. It's a BMI of 30. And if we look at some of the disease stage concepts, we know that earlier intervention makes a difference. Well before cancer is disseminated, it's best to get it when it's in the early stage. Obesity is the same thing. And we see that there in this one uh, study we did a few years ago where we demonstrate as the BMI goes down, the effectiveness goes up. And more to learn about that. We all know this chart about how uh, obesity has exploded in the U.S., but we're very mindful of the fact that it is not just a U.S. problem. It's a worldwide problem, as you can see here. To that end, we are in good shape for the future. Dr. Natan Sundell is our incoming president for IFSO, who will be followed by Kelvin Higa. So I know that international efforts will be very well represented. We started an outreach uh, with China this past year that culminated in two different visits uh, to China. And you can see Nen and I at that, um, at that meeting. I guess I should get a new tie. It looks like the same one. And um, the one thing that we've been able to do here is um, get our textbook translated into Chinese. And um, Charles Zeng has been absolutely instrumental in building that bridge. Why is it important? In a nation of a billion people, their 10% are, are diabetic. And that's 100 million di diabetics that are available, which is an enormous drain. In fact, if you start thinking about it, a nation's ability to deal with obesity and diabetes can provide a competitive advantage. So important that we address it. Now, I promised that there would be something to do with The Godfather, right? And if you look here, The Godfather, which is voted the number one film for men, uh, the opening line, just to remind everybody, is, I believe in America. And really, The Godfather is actually all about the American dream gone wrong. The Don, interesting, the Don has uh, um, wanted better for Michael. 
You know, he wanted to make sure that he became a senator, but there just wasn't enough time. But that's the American dream, isn't it? The American dream is that the next generation is going to be better than the last. However, that may not be the case if we keep going in the same direction when it comes to obesity. We may actually see life expectancy go down. So it's very critical that we address it, and that's where uh, ASMBS comes into play. And if you look at the economic burden here that's employed when it comes to uh, um, obesity, it's quite high. It's on the order of about um, $300 billion, which is actually more than the economic impact of the Affordable Care Act. So if you want to bend the cost curve, obesity is a good place to start. And you can see that there. This is a study we just presented here this, uh, yesterday. And you can see there that as time goes on, untreated patients' costs go up. Treated patients' costs go down. So again, here's maybe an approach to dealing with medical expenditures over time. Do also want to mention another toll that sometimes is paid by patients. And that toll is around attitudes. And we've heard that many times. And this is a columnist from the New York Times named Michael Kinsley. Michael Kinsley wrote this column where he said that um, Chris Christie is just too fat to run for president. Now, you can say whatever you want about uh, Governor Christie's politics, but he should have the same advantages that any other American should have, which is to run for higher office. Thankfully, another columnist wrote against him, and he pointed out that there are other health care, there are other leaders that have health conditions. The president freely admits he smokes. FDR was a big-time chain smoker and um, certainly didn't prevent him uh, from seeking higher office. And certainly the governor shouldn't be held back because of his health condition. You can see he's making some progress there. The other thing to mention, too, is the impact that uh, obesity has on the care that we provide, needed preventative care. As your weight goes up in the study we did a few years ago, we demonstrated that your ability to get those needed um, preventative services go down. So we need to change attitudes not only in public but also in our provision of care for um, patients. We teach a class at Stanford, hopefully for the next generation. And I think it's important to realize um, the struggle and the difficulty the patients face in losing weight when they self-treat. And I think it's important to take a look at this, not just from psychology, but from flat-out physiology. And this is, uh, just demonstrates the incredible difficulty there is with just through diet alone and the ability to keep it off over time. And why is that? Now, this is just part of the puzzle. We certainly don't have time to cut into all the different um, hormonal aspects, but you can see here ghrelin and other hormones. As people lose weight, their hormones go up. Uh, body's not stupid. It knows you've lost weight, and it will do everything in its power to regain that weight. And you can see here the effect of bypass on ghrelin. And one thing that you can see there, that this effect is not forever, but it gives you some time. We talk about the golden hour in trauma. Well, we have about a golden year for these patients so they can really ingrain those good habits that will take them in their, into the future. Now, I really believe this. I believe that surgery is a first responder for many public health epidemics, and it's been that way for many, many years. Well before we had um, all the different medications for cancer or for heart disease, and even TB used to be a surgically treated disease, we were there first. And we're not going to be able to treat every single patient, but we will treat one patient at a time, and we will learn from them. And that's where I think our role is so important as being first responders to this public health problem. Now, if you look at all the contributors as to why people gain weight, they're really legion. You know, you look at all these things that come through. It looks very complicated, very difficult to sort out, and it is. In fact, the problem of sorting things out is an old one. I don't know if you guys know the story of the Gordian knot. The legend was about this very intricate knot that, you know, couldn't be undone. The legend was whoever could undo this knot would be the emperor of the world. And there was a guy named Alexander the Great that came before this Gordian knot. He looked it over, examined it, thought about it, and he pulled out his sword and he cut it in half. So I think there's a lesson for us in that where we look at this difficult problem, we can apply the knife. And I think it's important that uh, we do this because we're needed. There's so many patients in need out there, roughly about uh, 18 million people. If that were a, a new state, we'd have the state of obesity, about 18 million people, about the size of Florida. And I know we're 4,000 plus strong, but, you know, that's how things start, you know, from small bands, and we can get our, our, um, our revolution started. Now, these are our numbers. As you see here, we've grown over the past few years. 
and you can see that the sleeve has increased over time and so have revisions. I want to give Dr. Jaime Ponce many thanks for um, chairing the Numbers Task Force and getting this done. And I also want to just uh, mention that, again, even though it seems that we may be uh, smaller in numbers, our ability here to really change our understanding and the treatment of obesity is very, very critical. I do want to mention one other thing um, that occurred to me one day when I was walking to, um, to Grand Rounds, and you can see Stanford's campus there, Rainbow, and it made me think about the, um, the effect of uh, white light going through a prism, and you can see that there. I actually bought this. Uh, so we could do this little video. And it made me think about what it is that we do. And we think a lot about what we do around weight loss, and, but we also need to think about the profound effect that weight loss has on other aspects of metabolism, everything from diabetes even to aging. And it's important to remember that. We know all this data about where we see the reduction in diabetic deaths over time, and we're making some progress. I want to share with you that the California Technology Assessment Forum actually endorsed gastric bypass for BMI 30 to 35. And what was the vote? It was 11 to 0. Blue Cross Technology Assessment Center as well. So we're developing that base. This is just a study we did at Stanford a few years ago, just looking at the impact of weight loss on our patients. And one thing we noticed, there was very little to no correlation between weight loss and the remission of diabetes for patients. The other concept to bring forward is around tertiary prevention. We hear that you know the way out of the obesity crisis is prevention. We're all for it. But what we do is preventative in nature, too. We prevent the future progression of disease. We can see that you know through our impact on cardiac risk factors. And uh, we can see it long term. These are seven-year data that demonstrate that those cardiac risk factors do remain low. Remember these uh, trend maps that we all see? If you put it in front of an epidemiologist and didn't tell them what the disease was, they might impugn that this is actually infectious because it's occurred so quickly. And it's gotten people to start thinking about how does all this work? Is there something to this rapid transmission of the disease? And this has been some work that we've done over the past few years. And we're looking at the impact that surgery can have on the microbiome. Microbiome, as you all know, are those little critters that reside in our intestine that allow us to uh, digest the food that we have, but it can have other impacts as well. One thing that we know that happens is if you disturb that balance between your gut microbiome, weight gain can happen. How do we know it? Because we used to do it all the time. We used to do it by giving antibiotics to animals, and we would see them gain weight. And that's what led us to look at this to figure out maybe how this works. This is one of the things we saw, that with weight loss surgery, one of these bacteria actually bloom. And we further saw that it impacts bile acids that also works on TR, TGRX5 that works on GLP-1. This is our ability to discover through our practice. Don't forget about the other things that we do within bariatric surgery, which is also changing our other metabolism, including testosterone for men. You see all those ads for low T. Well, the real answer to low T is not all those creams and things. It's probably bariatric surgery. And you can see that there uh, for that obese man. As he loses weight, he doubles his testosterone. I do want to also mention the fact that I think that when we look at the impact of bariatric surgery on the human condition, we can learn so much about who we are as human beings, everything from birth to old age. This is a study that we did with uh, Melinda Maggard here in UCLA demonstrating that as bariatric surgery patients lose weight, they have safer pregnancies and smaller babies. The other thing that you can see here, this is a topic that I know is near and dear to Harvey Sugarman's heart, is around pseudotumor cerebri. This is a young lady who is losing her vision. That's what those black dots represent. You can see the before and after. And that's a great change for that young adult. Here's another study that we did a couple of years ago demonstrating the impact that gastric bypass has on aging, something that's becoming more and more interest to all of us as we get older. Now, it's hard to do aging studies in human beings because you have to wait about 80 years before you see a result, but you can look at other things. These are surrogate markers for aging called telomeres. These are the ends of the chromosomes, and as chromosomes divide, they need to have some protection so they don't, they don't wear and tear. And you can see some of those um, telomeres at the end there. This is a study that we did that in a short amount of time, we actually saw telomeres get longer. So the impact that you can see for bariatric surgery is even above and beyond some of the other things that we know and has impact directly on this genetic material. So when we look at the human condition and discovery, there's many other things to consider as well uh, when it comes to joint disease. 
And uh, I'm lucky that I'm at Stanford. We have this thing called the Human Performance Lab. I'm going to show you this little video to demonstrate uh, some vector forces that occur with the obese patient on the left and our control patient on the right. And you can really, we can start to learn exactly how this works. Uh, there's that varus alignment of the feet and more pressure on med medial tubule compartment that may lead to osteoarthritis. We can have better understanding through our surgery and understanding our patients. Now, if we look here, I want to also mention the other effect, which is around family members. That's one of the reasons I loved um, Ted's talk is because it's an idea that's very near and dear to my heart, which is that when patients lose weight, they can have a collateral benefit, a halo effect, if you will. And this is a study that we published a few years ago where we demonstrated exactly that. And like uh, you can see, this one study that demonstrates the ability to get heavier occurs when you have obese friends and family. Why isn't the corollary true? It is true. And nothing says anything like a picture. And you can see husband and wife operating on the same day. There they are with their kids. And here they are about a year later. So you can see that the lessons that they learn, they can take home and transmit to their family. Again, uh, we go from family to, um, to molecules here. We know that obesity is a disease of inflammation. And you can see all the different things that are involved with it. Uh, and we did a study just demonstrating some of those things where you see increases in adiponectin, proinsulin, uh, GMCSF. All of those things get better in a short amount of time. All of this is to demonstrate one thing. What we do on a daily basis has some real big import about our understanding about the human condition. I'm going to just mention here a little bit about what we can do. I think you've seen the impact, obviously, the bariatric surgery can have, but how do we keep it going? How do we make it enduring? So a few things, and I told you I'd bring up dirty dancing here, and this is what's going to uh, relate to ASMBS, and that is that uh, there's a famous line in there, no, one's, no one puts baby in the corner. And uh, that's how I feel about uh, bariatric surgery. Nobody's going to put us in the corner, and we're making a lot of headway getting mainstreamed. And you can see those different organizations that we're now part of, everybody from National Quality Forum to AMA. So we're making a lot of progress. Now you can see here from this coverage map that we've made a lot of um, gains when it comes to state employees. And you can see now there's very few states that don't have coverage. Only one state does not have Medicaid coverage, that's Montana. Um, that's mainly because they didn't have a bariatric surgeon until not too long ago, but now they have one. And even though we've made that progress, we know that there's always challenges. Nins mentioned the sleeve gastrectomy challenge and how the society was able to meet it and see that change. And we have other challenges ahead of us. And as we do, I think it's important to think about what to consider. You know, what are some components of faith, if you will, around advocacy? First, safety and effectiveness always comes first. Having the data available makes a big difference. I will plead for the 11th commandment. This was uh, Ronald Reagan used to say this, thou shalt speak no ill of a fellow Republican. I think that we need to stay very united as a society because we are just getting started and it is important for us to stay together. Collaboration, seeing if we can get bigger with other uh, societies is very important. And of course, having patience and persistence. This is why we need it. This is the um, essential health benefit. And you can see there that we have 23 states that are covered and uh, 27 that are not. We did flip one of the states, which is Colorado. Many thanks to Medtronic's help in getting that done. So we've tried to do a lot. We've tried to do things around the toolkit. We've put ads in the roll call, which is the Congress um, industry paper, if you will. And, but I think it's time to start doing more. This is an example of that toolkit. So we can change some of this. There you go, Colorado switched. And you can see some of the things that we've been doing. And one of the things we've done is work very closely with the obesity care continuum. We all work better when we work together, and you can see that there. Here we all are meeting with the Surgeon General where we got our message across that not only prevention is important, but treatment is as well. And to the point that the obesity care continuum just recently filed a complaint to the Office of Civil Rights for HHS to make sure that we do get coverage because not covering bariatric surgery and other obesity treatments does discriminate against um, the obese patient who has higher rates of disability, higher rates of ethnic minority, and higher rates of um, gender disparity. Now we need to do more, and beyond the letter writing and complaints and things like that, we need to directly engage. Government is a health, um, medicine is now a government industry. It's 70% of 
funds that go towards medicine are actually out of uh, government. And this is a study that was done recently that showed the ability to get a meeting with uh, a legislator rises almost eightfold when you give a donation. So you guys have seen some of this around. I think if, we, if you're sick and tired of being sick and tired of not getting what we need and deserve, let's put uh, some action into place, which is this political action committee, and that way we can get our voices heard. And I think it's important that we do that so we can accomplish some of these goals. Now, the last movie here to mention is, of course, Rocky. When everybody who knows that uh, Rocky story, it's a terrific story about not giving up. You may not know the story about Sylvester Stallone. He was an out-of-work actor, uh, really penniless, didn't have enough money for rent. He had this great script he wrote, took it to the studio. They offered him a million bucks. He said, great, but the only way I'll do it is if I get to play the lead. And they said, no. He stuck to his commitment, and he ended up getting not only paid for his script, but also got to play the lead, and the rest is history. So I think what's important as we move forward and not giving up is to take a note of how we can get bigger and better. This is uh, Lewis Sullivan, famous quote, form at forever follows function, and he really changed how we build buildings. And one of the things that he did was really change the idea about how to build up. And in the old idea was about building up was just making the walls thicker, but he did something different, which is to give a skeleton to the uh, building and allow us to, to get higher. And I think there's a lesson for us in that, is that for us to get higher, we've got to be able to collaborate more. And that's something that we can do all together, and you can see that here. This is The Emperor of All Maladies. It's a um, great book about cancer, and the one thing that they know is when we make big advances in cancer was when we started to work together to have a lot of different therapies available. And this could be the future, you know, where we see all of these different um, tools coming together from lifestyle change all the way up to medications. Endoscopy is now available. And then we can also obviously bring in our mainstay, our safe, effective, and enduring therapy, which is bariatric surgery. And wouldn't it be great, just like we have all these cancer centers throughout the country, we need metabolic centers because of all the impact that obesity certainly has. So this is a, a place that we can all work together. Rules of innovation, you can see those listed there. The important thing is to find collaborator, collaborators and be able to work with them and find abilities to innovate. And this is one way that we can do it. And this is the summit that we just did not too long ago in Chicago. I want to thank NIN for giving, uh, giving the society the idea about getting this done. I want to thank Stacey Brethauer for helping make the second national summit such a big success. And look at all the people that were there. 35 different medical societies, unprecedented. We talked about the fact that we haven't had all these different specialties together since med school. You know, we're used to interact with people from different areas. And you can see all those people listed there. And we're going to continue this and make it enduring. Uh, I've got to have the obligatory photo, as you can see there. And these are some of the deliverables. And we are already making guidelines for those different societies, uh, everybody from the Association for Hip and Knee Surgery, even to ADA. And we look forward to their March Obesity Consensus Conference and also getting the word out when it comes to healthy hospitals as well as our, um, our film. Also want to thank um, Johnson & Johnson for this new app that they're putting together. This is a way to get that referring physician as well as uh, the um, uh, prospective patient to take a look at how to find uh, different people uh, and different uh, thought processes around how to treat obesity. And you can see that listed there. So we're trying to figure out as many things as we can figure out to get the word out, because I think that's one thing that we all understand is the better educated people are about bariatric surgery, the more success we'll have. It all starts, obviously, with safety, and you can see that there. Dr. Wolf was kind enough to ask me to co-author this many years ago, and what we called for at that point in time was creating a network of hospitals that were devoted to the care and welfare of the obese patient. And I think one thing that's also important to note is that as we grow, we're actually pretty young. You know, look how old the college is. The college is over 100 years old. We're just getting started. There are so many things that are still left to do. And these are some of the accomplishments through our accreditation program, MBS AQIP. I really want to thank Teresa Fraker, Jennifer Bradford, Amy robinson Garachi, and everybody else at MBS AQIP in getting this done. And you can see there that there were more site visits than there were days in the year. And that's all the good work that's being done uh, through MBS AQIP. NIN very eloquently showed us in this paper that we've made tremendous progress when it comes to decreasing mortality. And one of the reasons for it, I believe, is because of accreditation. 
Now, as we move forward, we've got to go beyond mortality. And we know that mortality is, is very important, but we're already down to about a 0.1% mortality rate nationwide. Where are other places that we can find the next frontier when it comes to quality improvement? Readmissions is another good one. And it incorporates a lot of different elements, everything from safety to satisfaction, even to cost. And this is a, an initial pilot project we did at Stanford. Geisinger's done the same thing through Tony Patrick's work. And the idea is to reduce readmissions. And we were able to do that. And I'm proud to say that we've now rolled this out nationwide. And this is the so-called DROP project, decreasing readmissions through opportunities provided. There's different elements to it, everything from a pre-op educational video. So this way, the patient gets a standardized dose of education that's not dependent on your schedule or your mood. This is a way to get the message across, getting the phone calls to the patients. Here's one example of that video, and it also demonstrates the incredible worth of the multidisciplinary program that we have within bariatric surgery. Hi, I'm Nina Crowley. I'm a bariatric surgery registered dietitian nutritionist and I work with patients in Charleston, South Carolina at the Medical University of South Carolina where I've practiced for over eight years. I'm here today to work with you so that you can optimize your nutrition in the early post-op weeks after you have surgery so you can stay hydrated, get in the proper nutrition, and not get readmitted to the hospital. We're going to review weight loss prior to surgery, the diet progression while you're here in the hospital and at home, hydration, fluid, and you can see all of our different centers uh, assembled here through our quilt, and these are different help cards that each center gives to patients so they know exactly who to call. So that's what's important about working together. Uh, we're making some progress. These are very early results through the DROP project, and you can see there that we've dropped uh, overall readmissions, but the place we've made the most gains are in the, the centers that have the highest rates of readmission. I look forward to completing the project in March of next year. So closing with a few other thoughts around outreach and understanding, and we do need to get the message across to public at large. You heard about our efforts to the referring physicians, that's the obesity summit, but we want to get word out to the patients as well. And this is a program that we started, which is direct uh, patient contact, direct to consumer, if you will. And this is something that we did with Pandora. We were able to create a 30-second audio spot, and you can see some of the impressions that have already occurred there uh, through our, our spot. The other thing that we've done are our TV public service announcements. Remember Nin's great video from last year? We were able to trim that down to a 30-second public service announcement that I'll show you in just a moment that demonstrates uh, the effectiveness of bariatric surgery. It's going to air throughout the country. We've already hit in three different areas, Salt Lake City, Honolulu, and uh, Johnston in, in Pennsylvania. So the word is going to get out across the country. And here's that, uh, that PSA. struggle with my image as a nurse because I'm taking care of patients and I'm supposed to be counseling them and I'm 100 pounds overweight. I had the reality hitting me in the face that guys I was right in the locker next to are dead. And for me, it was just that simple. It came down to what are the risks of doing nothing versus the potential gain. For more information, go to WeStartToday.com. So we hope that's going to help drive the needle and get more patients interested. Here's another way of driving the needle. This is our patient portal on the ASMBS website called This Time It Counts. Patients can upload their own story. So if you're a prospective patient, say from Alabama and diabetic female, and you're trying to figure out, is this right for me? Well, you can go online and you can see that patient's individual story that may match yours and it may make you think, that person's just like me. Maybe this is something I should do. Another place that we've tried to raise awareness is through our ASMBS Film Festival. We're in L.A., so we've got to have some sort of award show. And you can see here that um, we had a, uh, a blue ribbon panel, and we take uh, special effort to include entertainment, communication, the media. So those people are all involved in raising awareness around obesity. And that's what this film contest was. And we ended up getting 24 different videos uh, that were given to us, and it's now ASMBS's. And we now have had our winners, who we'll, we'll show uh, more of tonight. But I just wanted to show you briefly the top four videos, and I believe that we have some of those uh, video winners here in the audience with us. I know, I think I saw Tracy Martinez just a moment ago, and she's here as well, and maybe Tim Ehrlich, is he here? 
Uh, if you guys could stand, please. We want to recognize you. Thank you. And Cora Rieger, thank you very much. Here are some of these award-winning videos. I knew that I would never look like Ryan Gosling, so I finally embraced obesity as part of my character. This one's for the fat kids! For me, that was a slippery slope. After high school, I put on more and more weight until I pushed 300 pounds. When you're that heavy, it's hard to find light at the end of the tunnel. I couldn't find the joy in exercise or eating right. I didn't even know how to do those things. You know, it's funny. Even though I have obesity, I've sat in judgment of myself too. Harsh judgment. Because when the world blames you over and over again for how you are, eventually you believe that that's what you are, despite what you know to be true about yourself. It's exhausting. You get beaten down. And when you're beaten down, it's harder to fight for your right to affordable, evidence-based medical and surgical treatment. People don't normally think of obesity as a disease. My goal is to convince you that it is. A disease is actually defined as a chronic medical condition or impairment of the body or one of its parts, resulting from various causes, characterized by a definable group of signs and symptoms. Okay, well let's break it down a little bit. An impairment of the body. Besides the obvious physical manifestations of obesity, obesity wreaks havoc on your insides from hormonal to cellular to organ disruption, resulting from various causes, stress, genetics, environmental factors, these are just a few components that can lead to obesity. What I would like to say to doctors, first and foremost, is that it's okay to talk to their patients about obesity. Over the years, many years, as I gained more and more weight, I never had a general practitioner, internist, or OBGYN ever say anything to me about my weight. So I think it's important to realize that we need to get the message across to folks because we've done the hard work, which is showing how safe and effective bariatric surgery is. And it's so important to give these patients second chances. Look at this one guy. You may know who he is, how many times he failed in running for office and losing until finally getting to become president in 1860, Abraham Lincoln. One of my most favorite quotes, and this is around persistence because I think that's such an important thing to have to make sure that we get accomplishments. That's something that's quite important. Here we are in Hollywood, this is just a land of second chances. You can see that just in the name changes for people. We can also see that there were second chances provided to all of us, whether we're from Mexico or Vietnam or Argentina or El Salvador. And you can see that for all of us. The other thing that you can see is that I have th um, two very good friends, Jaime Ponce and Nguyen, the three amigos you see us there. We actually got the hats to prove it. And you can also tell that um, uh, we, we like to go to events together. But now we're the four musketeers with Raul coming forward. We're going to be in great shape for next year. And I look forward to working with him in the future. The other thing I just want to close with is, you know, what's in common with Montgomery and El Salvador? Warm weather, perhaps. Football? Maybe not. There are different kinds of footballs, but there's tradition, love of family, and faith. The other thing that uh, you get to know is that both of my grandfathers in El Salvador were surgeons. You can see them listed there in the hospital back in El Salvador. My brothers gave me second chances even after questionable wardrobe choices like this. Of course, my parents, who I love very much and I can't look at right now, gave me second chances. Obviously, my mom. This is one thing that my mom did. I had uh, broken my finger, and the hand surgeon said that it had to be removed. And she said, absolutely not. He needs to keep that finger. So you can see that there. Thank you. Gracias, mommy. This is a picture of um, Jordana. Uh, Mason, who passed away recently. And I think um, this picture shows that um, the thing that keeps us together is obviously our love of family, my love for Gavin. You can see us there. Thank you, Gavin. Love you. And it's important that we provide these other second chances to patients. This is our symbol 
around uh, bariatric surgery at Stanford, the butterfly rebirth. It's important to remember that when it comes to um, helping people. Very definition of humanity's failure the, and the ability to rescue and have resiliency and recovery is important. This is an old quote from uh, Leonard Cohen's song, There's a Crack in Everything, but that's what lets the light come in. And I think it's important for us. It's important for not only our society, but the entire society. And you can see that from a society that doesn't even show people's faces. We give them a chance. And we need to give them a chance because they've tried in so many ways. This just shows how many weight loss attempts there have been. But there can be new beginnings for patients, and you see that listed there. We give them second chances if there's any sort of complication in a hospital with better failure to rescue rates. And it's important that we give them those second chances because we know that this works, and we see that survival benefit demonstrated here. So who's going to rescue these patients? Well, I hope it's everybody in this room. And I'll close here with just one last thought that, you know, everybody knows that I like applause. And when applause is over, the one thing I can tell you is that the mission will endure and that our cause will continue. And I would really like um, my family to come up as well as the entire EC and everybody here to celebrate what we've done this past year uh, because it's important to understand that all of this doesn't happen in a vacuum. It happens together. And I uh, have one last quote from um, you guys can all come up. I would really appreciate it because you mean everything to me. I'll close with one uh, last quote, uh, which is from Dirty Dancing. I had the time of my life. So thank you guys so much. <laughs>